Well, welcome to Holy Trinity and St Saviour's Sermons. Here we seek to live life to the full and I hope this sermon inspires you to do exactly that. The reading today is from Matthew chapter 4 beginning at verse 18. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will make you fishers of men. At once they left their nets and followed him. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John. They were in a boat with their father Zebedee, preparing their nets. Jesus called them, and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. This is the word of the Lord. do some adjusting here. I, uh, I need both hands for waving around. There we go. And about there. Can you hear me? Oh, never mind. <laughs> so, now I can't see my notes. There we are. So, I'm beginning to wonder whether it's time to dispense with Christianity. Good, he hasn't dragged me away yet. Um, Christianity is a brand. It carries so much baggage, doesn't it? The idea of Christianity. If you think about it, the Crusades. Uh, not a great look. You think about imperialism and going around and taking over other countries and claiming you're doing them good by sucking out all their raw materials for your benefit. Oh, and you can have Christianity too. We think about people going into battle in the First World War with badges that say, Gott mit uns, God is with us, uh, as they go and do such terrible things. You see Orthodox priests blessing Russian fighter jets as they take off to bomb Syrians. And you think, Christianity is not a desperately good look, is it? And then before we start thinking, uh, that's overseas, we... I've only got to look back over the last 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years at the scandals of abuse that we've seen happen in our churches. And we realize that Christianity doesn't have a good look. That as soon as something becomes formalized, institutionalized, and just generally organized to make sure that the peasants do what they're told, that things go horribly, horribly wrong. Christianity, as a word, as a description, often to people means pompous, middle class, uh, white. Um, whereas it comes from someone who was poor and Jewish. Christianity, maybe it's time we put the brand away. Jesus, on the other hand, now that's a different thing altogether. Now the extraordinary thing about the story of Jesus that you read in the Gospels is this, that Everything he said was based about him. About what, who he was. 
Everything comes down to who is Jesus. The fascinating thing about when Jesus talks is that it's not about a religion, a system, a philosophy, or a way of life. It's about a person. Did you notice in the reading that when Jesus called people, he called them to follow me. He said, follow me. Jesus, all through the Gospels, consistently says that this story is about me, he says. Unlike any other religious leader you could name, Jesus doesn't point towards a system or a philosophy that his followers should accept. He points to himself. In fact, Jesus even says to his disciples, his followers, that if you want to know about God, he's here. That's what Jesus basically says to people. He says, you're looking for God, God is here. Look. The story we've just read of Jesus calling his first followers comes straight after an incident where he starts speaking in his local synagogue. That was the tradition. Still is. That uh, you open up the words of the Old Testament and anyone can stand up and speak. And Jesus stands up and speaks, and he speaks eloquently. And he talks about the kingdom of God. And he talks about the words of Isaiah the prophet. And everyone's going, wow, this guy's good. And then he finishes it by saying, and this is happening here today. And everyone goes, what? Chases him out. Wants to abs actually kill him. Because he is saying, do you know what? I am it. This was his basic message. He'd already started doing this. And he says, follow me. All through the gospel accounts, you see Jesus standing up and saying, I am it. It is me. If you read John's gospel, you will find in there at least seven places where Jesus says, I am this. I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No, not that. Me. I. 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 And this. He's standing up in front of a group of the great religious leaders of the day, the local preachers, and they say, show us God. And he says, I and the Father are one. Me. I. When people spoke to him and said, we don't like you. Get out. You're ruining religion. And he says, what am I doing? I heal the sick. I bring people who are sad into happy lives. I do great things. And they say, no, no, no. It's none of that stuff. It's because you claim to be one with God. That was the big badge that he bore all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They said, yeah, you can be good. You can be nice, everything. Like that. But... We can't bear the fact that your main message is, I am him. C.S. Lewis, the guy who wrote the Narnia books, he also wrote a lot of very good books about Jesus and faith and what it all meant. And he put it like this when he said, what do you think of Jesus? He said this, he said, 
I'm trying here to prevent anyone saying the really foolish thing that people often say about Jesus. They say, I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great moral teacher, but I don't want to see him as God. You see, that's the one thing, says C.S. Lewis, we must not say. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic or else he would be the devil of hell. You must make your choice. Either this man was and is the son of God or he's a madman or something worse. You can shut him up for a fool, you can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But let's not come up with any patronizing nonsense about him being a great human teacher. He has not left that open to us. He did not intend to. If most people who say, oh, I like Jesus, he's great, he talks so nicely, have obviously never read the Gospels. If you read the Gospels themselves and you see the claims that Jesus made about himself, you've either got to dismiss him as mad or realize that he is something very very special. Jesus wasn't nice. If you were a hypocrite, he wasn't nice. If you were a person who committed acts of injustice, he wasn't nice. There's a wonderful passage, since we're in the Narnia books, there's a wonderful passage, one, it's my favorite bit from The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, where Mr. Beaver stands up and talks about Aslan, the picture of Jesus. And he says, nice, he's not nice, but he's good. The question that Jesus confronts us with and has done for 2,000 years is not, am I nice, but how have I reacted to Jesus? What's the difference? What does it mean to see Jesus, to say, yes, I am going to follow him? You see, Jesus said, doesn't say, follow me. He's not saying, follow my teachings, copy me, live a good life. They're, of course, they're all great things. They're good things. But they're the results not the essence of what it is to be a Jesus follower. Maybe the, a way of looking at this is to think about those times, I don't know whether you've ever done this, when you've been to a place abroad and uh, you have one of those tour guides with their umbrella. Been there? Done that? When I'm in the middle of Rome, in a great crowd trying to see the fountains or the Colosseum or whatever. I am not interested in whether I understand the teachings of the guide. I am not interested in whether I can tell you as much about Rome. I just want to know where that umbrella is, so I'm not lost. I'm interested in that person and where they are and whether I'm there. Maybe a good way of thinking about what does it mean for Jesus to say, follow me, is to look at one of the most well-known sayings that he gave when his disciples asked him, what does it mean to follow? And uh, we actually have said it once already today. Because when Jesus was asked by his disciples to show them the way to God, Jesus replied, I am the way and the truth and the life. What does it mean to follow me? 
It means to know that Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. When someone realizes and submits to who Jesus is, they discover the way, direction, purpose. When we realize that Jesus was absolutely serious about who he is, and we submit to that, we find that life has direction and purpose. People often un have misunderstood what Jesus meant when he talks about eternal life. There is this sort of um, picture of Christianity, which is that basically people like me stand here and they tell you, be good or God will punish you and you won't go to heaven. Inter uh, people have heard me here say this lots of times, but the Bible's not really awfully clear about heaven and stuff. There's, it's sort of basically uh, sort of, it's going to be great and mm, detail, mm, too difficult to describe. But one of the things that you will discover if you actually read the New Testament is it doesn't spend a lot of time talking about heaven in terms of, you know, be good or else God will punish you forever. It doesn't say that a lot. What it says is God's got that handled. Don't worry about that. God's got that all dealt with. Now, let's talk about now. We could translate the idea of eternal life as, it's better translated as the life of the ages, the life to live that actually matches what God's purpose is. Jesus preached that he was ushering in a kingdom, a world where evil defeated and justice and peace reigned, and guess what? You can be on board with that. To follow Jesus is to join the direction, to actively be part of its fulfillment, to be on board with what God is actually doing. Jesus said, history has a direction, and the direction is where I'm taking you. I've often put it like this, in terms of carpentry, those of you who've ever done need do it yourself. Don't ask my wife what my do it yourself is like, but uh, I know what the principle is. And it's much better to cut with the grain, isn't it, when it comes to a piece of wood. And when you are walking with Jesus, you are cutting with the grain of history. He is the way. And when we submit to Jesus and we understand who he really is, we find that Jesus is the truth. Now, we could talk a lot, if you like, about how true the story of Jesus is. And I can tell you why I think it's true and what the actual historical uh, basis of all that is. But I don't have that much time because the water's getting cold. And... But... That's not the most important truth. When Jesus says, I am the truth, he's not talking about historical truth. He's not talking about factual truth as such. What he's saying is the truth of what does God think about me? What truly does God think about you? You see, Jesus presents the ultimate truth about God to you. And what is that truth is that he loves you so much that he was prepared to send his own son to die for you. What is the truth about who you are? The truth is that you are loved by this God. How does God, way out there, beyond all dimensions, of understanding and trying to get our head around, show you how he can love you. What does he do? He sends his son into the world as flesh and blood to lay down his life for you. You are loved by God. 
His desire for you is to be all that you can be and should be. That is the truth. And Jesus says, I am the, tr the truth. When you see me, you see that truth. He is the way, the direction. He is the truth about what God thinks about you. And he is the life. What is it to be alive? What does being alive mean? I would put it to you that one of the fundamental facts of life is relationship. Life is all about our relationships with those around us. When our relationships fail, whether it's within a family, with our friends, with the one we thought we loved, we feel lost because something's been cut off. Life is not as it should be. When we lose someone, what is it we lose? It's not just their body, it's their laugh. It's the times we talked. It's the fact that we knew they were always there for us. Life is about relationship. And the same applies to our relationship with God. Relationships are three-dimensional. God made us to live in relationship with him. God's intention has always been to have that relationship. Someone put it like this. They said there is a God-shaped hole in all of us that only God can fill. Jesus said, I am the life, the one who unlocks that ability to have that relationship with God. He is the way, the truth, and the life. Is, he said, I, me. Never mind about whether you're a good person or not such a good person. Wherever you've been, whatever you've done, whoever you are, it's not about that. It's about him and about how we respond to him. So where do we take this? What do we do? Well, some people here are followers of Jesus. In fact, most of us probably, because we're in a church, I guess. The challenge for us who say that we're followers of Jesus is always this. What difference does it make that you are a follower of Jesus? Have you sometimes just settled for second best by just being nice? Because that's different. Lots of people are nice. Lots of people are very nice who couldn't care less about Jesus. Being a follower of Jesus means actively pursuing who Jesus is and what it means to trust him in the circumstances we find ourselves. Are we going to nail ourselves to that mast and say, yeah, I'm his? When it comes to something, a crisis that comes up in my life, that's where I'm going to look. When it comes to decisions about what I'm going to do with my life, that's where I look. When it comes to what I do with my wallet, that's where I'm going to look. When it comes to standing up and saying, who am I? That's where I'm going to look. Effectively, the question for all of those people who say we're followers of Jesus is this question. If Jesus didn't exist, what difference would it make to your life? Because this, the answer is, uh, that means I've got another hour on Sunday morning. Then something's wrong, isn't it? Following Jesus 
is about our focus. And the question is always, where is it? Where's your focus? Jesus says, follow me. Not a religion, not a philosophy, not an hour on a Sunday morning. Follow me. And if today you're not yet a follower of Jesus, can I urge you to really think about the claims of Jesus, about what he says about himself, what he says he is, the fact that around you, or maybe at home around you, there are people here who have committed their entire life on the basis that this is not just nice, but it's real. In fact, it's better than nice, it's good. Can I urge you to think about those claims? Now, I haven't got time here today to go over the historical evidence for the reality of Jesus, the events of his life, his death, his resurrection, the effect he has on people who do follow him. I haven't got... I wish I could, but I'll be dragged away. But if you want to, I'm, I'll be here. You can come and ask me some of that stuff. That's fine. Happy to do that. Uh, if you really want to know more, can I, uh, can I give you a book? Happy to do that. I've got lots more where these came from. Take one away. Called Why Jesus by the chap who invented the Alpha Course, which some of you may have heard of. And it's a brilliant summary of why Jesus is so important. Please come and take one. I'm very happy to give those to you. Please do. Don't just leave it and say, oh, you know, those religious people, they do go on. Not interested in religion, we're interested in Jesus. You see, while there's so much to regret about the official church and the actions of so-called Christians down the age, when we take a look at Jesus, we ask yourself, what is my way, my truth, my life, and does his sound better? So for all of us, let's worry less about being Christians, and let's ask us more, ourselves more, the question, are we following Jesus? And I don't think you can go wrong if you do that.